Hi everyone, this lesson is on nightmares, nightmare disorder, and sleep or night terrors. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about the differences between nightmares and sleep terrors. We'll also talk about some of the specific signs and symptoms that occur with each of them, and we'll talk about how these conditions are diagnosed and how they are treated. So both nightmare disorder and sleep or night terrors are parasomnia disorders involving fear-invoking imagery during sleep. They are considered to be sleep-wake disorders. So we're going to talk about these two conditions, and then we'll talk about some of the differences here. So let's first talk about the pathophysiological differences between the two, which will help us distinguish these two types of conditions. So nightmares are going to be different than sleep terrors because they occur during rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. This is the dreaming type of sleep. This is where the body becomes essentially paralyzed, where the patient loses muscle control and their eyes move rapidly. So this is the dreaming stage of sleep. And the reason that nightmares may occur may be due to immaturity of neural circuits. So this can be something that is in common with other parasomnia disorders. And this is why we can see this more commonly in children, as we will talk about later on in this lesson. However, some cases may be related to underlying neuroanatomical abnormalities, so certain degenerative conditions. Again, this can all play in with certain issues in neural circuitry. And then if we look at sleep terrors, sleep terrors are going to occur during non-rapid eye movement sleep or NREM sleep. This is going to be during deep sleep. And sleep terrors may be due to disruption of delta or slow wave sleep stages, which are going to be stages three and four, and or serotonergic dysregulation. And the reason that serotonergic dysregulation may play a role here is because there is some evidence that taking SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors can actually reduce sleep terrors. So there may be some issue with serotonergic functioning. And there are a wide variety of factors that can trigger or increase the likelihood of having sleep terrors. And these can include genetic predisposition, stress, sleep deprivation or dysregulation, noise, fever, medications, and some other factors as well. So again, nightmares occur during rapid eye movement sleep and sleep terrors occur during non-rapid eye movement sleep. And this is going to help us distinguish between some of the signs and symptoms we will talk about later on in this lesson. Now let's talk about the epidemiology of nightmare disorder and sleep terrors. So nightmare disorder is estimated to affect approximately 6% of the population. It's common in young boys, particularly between the ages of 4 to 7 years old. And nightmares themselves are very common, and it's estimated that three quarters of children have had at least one nightmare. As mentioned before, there may be some association with nightmares and neurodegenerative conditions because we see frequency of nightmares increasing with certain neurodegenerative conditions. Some of these neurodegenerative conditions include frontotemporal dementia and Lewy body dementia. Again, this comes back to some of the possibility of certain issues with neurocircuitry that may be playing a role in nightmares and nightmare disorder. And there's a higher frequency of nightmares and nightmare disorder in patients or individuals with reduced levels of well-being. These include patients with insomnia, certain significant life stresses, anxiety disorder, depression, separation anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Now let's talk about sleep terrors. Sleep terrors are estimated to affect approximately 3% of the general population. It's more likely to occur in young children, and the onset of sleep terrors is often between the ages of 4 to 12. It may occur more frequently in adolescents who suffer from migraines. So adolescents who suffer from migraines are more likely to have sleep terrors. So this is an interesting association to make note of here. And there is a higher risk of sleep terrors if there are other affected family members. So there are certain gene alleles that have been found to be associated with more sleep terrors, and these include human leukocyte antigen or HLA-DQB105 or HLA-DQB104 alleles. So having either of these alleles increases the risk that you will have sleep terrors. So this plays a role in what we talked about in the last slide where there is a genetic predisposition to having sleep terrors. And as we can see here, both nightmare disorder and sleep terrors can be related to other quality of life issues, including stresses. So I also want to highlight that here as well. Let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms of both nightmare disorder and sleep terrors. And we're going to compare each of them to see the similarities and differences between these two conditions. So again, as mentioned before, nightmare disorder occurs in REM sleep, and it's more likely to occur in the second half of a major sleep episode. So if you look at the sleep stages, a patient will go into stage one, two, three, four, and they will go from four into three, two, REM. 
And as the night goes on, the longer they've been sleeping, each cycle will have a bigger period of REM sleep. This is the reason why we can see nightmares occurring more frequently in the second half of the major sleep episode. Having said that, it can occur at any point during the night. And with regards to nightmares, they're going to be vivid and have a story-like feature to them. Because they occur in REM sleep, they're going to be a dream. But they're going to be very dysphoric, meaning that they're going to be very troubling and disturbing to the patient. So the patient can be very afraid when they awaken. And there may be some other negative emotions, including anger, disgust, and sadness that may occur as well with nightmares. With regards to sleep terrors, as I mentioned before, they occur in NREM sleep. So this is going to be slow wave sleep or deep sleep. So again, we can see here that we go into stage one, two, three, four. So stage three and four are going to be slow wave sleep or that deep sleep. So this is where we're going to see sleep terrors occurring. And as we can see later on in the night, more of the sleep stages will become dominated by REM sleep and less of slow wave sleep will take place later on in the sleep episode. So that is going to be the reason why we can see sleep terrors more likely occurring in the first third of the night, usually the first 90 minutes of sleep. So there's going to be a partial awakening from slow wave sleep. So it's not going to be the same type of awakening we see with nightmares, it's going to be partial awakening. We'll talk about this in more detail here in a moment. So sleep terrors are going to be simple, vague, and frightening images. They're not going to have that story-like feature that we see with nightmares. And the patient is often not going to remember a coherent dream. They're going to have what we would call amnesia for the sleep terror. So often they will awaken from this episode. They may be very disoriented, and they may not remember what they've seen, but they know there has been some frightening images, and they will not have that story-like feature that we see with nightmares. So getting into more detail with regards to nightmare disorder and sleep terrors, nightmare disorder, again, may or may not abruptly awaken a patient. So a patient may have a nightmare, and then they may continue to sleep going through their regular sleep stages and may not even remember the nightmare or remember parts of it later on when they awaken. If they do awaken, from the nightmare, it may be difficult getting back to sleep. They may be so troubled from the nightmare and the story that they've seen in the nightmare that they may have difficulty getting back to sleep. And nightmares can be associated with signs and symptoms of autonomic arousal, including sweating and shortness of breath. You can imagine if you're having a very scary experience, you can have sweating and shortness of breath because often, as we will see, patients in nightmares will be running or trying to get away from something. And nightmare disorder is associated with restless leg syndrome as well. In contrast to nightmares, sleep terrors have an abrupt or partial awakening. So it's abrupt because often the child who is experiencing the sleep terrors will immediately sit up and be awakened, but they're not quite awake. They don't know what is happening. They're disoriented. So there is partial awakening and they're often able to go back to sleep. They can have panicking and autonomic arousal. So they can have tachycardia, tachypnea, and sweating. So tachycardia is going to be an increased heart rate, and tachypnea is going to be increased breathing rate. And it can resolve quite quickly. So they can have this very increased arousal. They can awaken. They can sit up quickly. But then they can calm down and go back to sleep. Screaming and crying is going to be common with sleep terrors. When they sit up quickly, they can start to scream and cry. So again, it's going to be often a child who may abruptly sit up, scream, but not be able to describe what has happened. They may just have this feeling of a very vague, scary situation or event. In adults, it's not going to occur as screaming or crying. It's often going to occur as agitation. So this can be something distinguishing adults with sleep terrors as opposed to children with sleep terrors. So those are some major distinguishing features between nightmares and sleep terrors. Because sleep terrors are often going to be vague imagery, it's difficult to talk about what is experienced in sleep terrors, but we will talk about what is mostly experienced in nightmares, and we're going to break down the different types of nightmares and what nightmares are most common in patients. So nightmares are often going to be broken down into post-traumatic nightmares and idiopathic nightmares. And as its name suggests, post-traumatic nightmares occur after a patient has had some trauma in their real life. So the nightmare itself a post-traumatic nightmare is going to replicate some of or all of the past traumatic event in some way. So there's going to either be a replication of that event or some elements of that past traumatic event. And with regards to idiopathic nightmares, they're not related to any prior traumatic event and they're often going to be very imaginative because it's going to be some elaborate story that's very disturbing to the patient. It's not going to be 
rooted in some real life event or situation. So when we actually look at some of the response of a patient who has a post-traumatic nightmare in an idiopathic nightmare, patients who have post-traumatic nightmares are going to have increased arousal, increased nocturnal awakenings, and feelings of helplessness. So it'll seem that they cannot get away from that past traumatic event. They will have increased sweating, shortness of breath, increased heart rate. They'll have a stronger response to the nightmare. And they can often have increased nocturnal awakenings. They can have more of the issues that surround nightmares. And because they keep experiencing that trauma over and over again, they can have feelings of helplessness as well. So now let's talk about some of the common nightmares or the common themes that occur in nightmares. So nightmares are often going to be related to survival, physical safety, and physical integrity. So the most common type of nightmare is going to be a nightmare involving being chased or pursued. This is going to be the most common nightmare theme we see in patients. So this is going to be the most common nightmare theme, and the rest of them are not going to be in any particular order, but they are going to be very common nightmare themes. So another theme that can be seen in nightmares that's going to be common is a nightmare involving being physically attacked. Another common one is going to be a nightmare involving death and or disease. Other nightmares that are very common include phobia-related nightmares, so things like snakes. Animals and creatures can populate nightmares of children, so this can be something we can see different in adults and children. And then another type of nightmare that can be common is loss of control. And as I alluded to just a moment ago, the specific content of the nightmare is going to ultimately depend on the patient's age. So nightmares in adults are going to differ from nightmares in children. So as we just mentioned, children can often have nightmares involving animals or imaginary creatures. Now let's talk about how these disorders are diagnosed. We'll first talk about nightmare disorder. So nightmare disorder is going to be a clinical diagnosis using oftentimes DSM-5 criteria. So nightmare disorder, according to the DSM-5 criteria, involves the following, and some of this is adapted from the DSM-5. Recurrent episodes of nightmare. So nightmares are going to be dreams that are long in duration, well-remembered, troubling, so they're going to be dysphoric and involve something to do with safety, security, or threat to survival. So that's what a nightmare is. And it's often going to occur in the second half of a major sleep episode. The second important criteria with regards to nightmare disorder, according to DSM-5, is that episodes cause clinically significant impairment or distress in social or occupational domains. This is always going to be an important aspect of any disorder because if a patient is having these episodes and it's not really affecting anything in their life, it's hard to say that this is a disorder. When they have these recurrent episodes of nightmares that are causing some impairment or distress in their social or occupational domains, perhaps they're losing some of their relationships or they have lost their job because of it, this criteria is going to be considered to be met. Another criteria of a nightmare that is required for nightmare disorder is that the patient will awaken from a nightmare and is quickly oriented and alert. And this is going to differ from sleep terrors because when a patient awakens from sleep terrors, they are disoriented. Another important aspect of diagnosing nightmare disorder is that it's not caused by another psychiatric or medical disorder. And the nightmares are not attributable to physiological effects of a drug or medication. We can then break down nightmares according to how long a patient has been suffering from them. We can break it down into acute, subacute, and persistent. So acute nightmare disorder is when nightmares have been occurring for less than one month in duration. Subacute nightmare disorder is when nightmares have been occurring for one to six months in duration. And then persistent nightmare disorder is going to be when nightmares have been occurring for greater than six months in duration. And we can break nightmare disorder down even further into different intensities. So there's mild, moderate, and severe nightmare disorder. Mild nightmare disorder is going to be when there's less than one episode per week. Moderate is when there's going to be multiple episodes of nightmare per week. And severe nightmare disorder is when there's going to be an episode of a nightmare every night. So those are the differences in severity. Let's talk about the diagnosis of sleep terrors. So sleep terrors are often going to be clinically diagnosed with the following criteria from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, or AASM. There is DSM-5 criteria for sleep terrors as well, and they are very similar to what we're going to talk about here. So if you want to look up those criteria, you can look those up as well. So according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, night terrors or sleep terrors involve the following. The first criteria is going to be partial or incomplete awakening episode that occurs repeatedly. So they can often awaken, but they're not quite awake. They're disoriented and they can go back to sleep. Episodes involve abrupt terror and screaming or vocalization. The patient does not respond or 
has an inadequate response to intervention or redirection. So if you were to try to calm the child down, they often are not calmed down when they are experiencing this episode. So they'll sit up, scream. You try to calm them down, but it doesn't really work. They don't really respond. Another important criteria of night or sleep terrors is that there is no or limited dream imagery. So there's very limited imagery of the episode and they do not remember the images or they have partial remembering so they can remember a little bit, but often it can be complete amnesia. So there can be partial or complete amnesia for the images they have experienced. Again, they're going to be simple, vague, frightening images that they see. It's not going to be a story like we see with nightmares. During the episode, there is severe fear response with signs and symptoms of autonomic arousal like tachycardia, tachypnea, diaphoresis, which is sweating, in midriasis. So midriasis would be a widening of the pupils or dilation of the pupils. And as with other diagnostic criteria, it's important to exclude other causes that may be leading to these night terrors or sleep terrors, including mental disorders, sleep conditions, and medications. Let's talk about the treatment of both nightmare disorder and sleep terrors. So with regards to nightmare disorder, it's important that the patient is reassured because this is often going to be a self-limiting condition. So again, most of the time it's going to occur in young children, and as they grow up, it's going to resolve on its own. So having nightmares can actually be considered to be developmentally normal in young children, because we can see that their neural circuitry is immature, and it takes some time for that neural circuitry to develop. And we can see often a outgrowing or resolution of nightmares as the child gets older. So if nightmares occur in young children, most of them will outgrow these nightmares, but we can see nightmares still occurring in adults as well, especially if there are particular stressors, and that can be important because they may require counseling services. So if there are significant stressors or if patient has PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder that is causing post-traumatic nightmares, counseling services can be important for those patients. Other measures can also be utilized as well, including avoiding screen time two hours prior to bedtime. This can help reduce nightmares from occurring. Dream content discussion can help. So this would be image rehearsal therapy. Others are going to be stress management, helping with reducing insomnia and helping to treat PTSD in patients who have PTSD. And then hypnosis can also be used in some other cases. And with regards to the treatment of sleep terrors, again, these are often going to be benign and self-limiting as well. So in young children who have sleep terrors, they may spontaneously resolve at puberty. So this is an interesting fact to make note of. However, it's also important to monitor, support, and reassure and educate the parents. So a lot of times parents can be very worried and concerned about sleep terrors as a child can quickly sit up and start screaming and yelling. This can be very distressing for the parents. So it can be important to educate them to let them understand what sleep terrors are and that often they are going to be benign and self-limiting. If there are any other factors that can be increasing the likelihood of having sleep terrors like insomnia, other stressors in life, it's important to treat those issues and comorbidities as well. And then there are other measures that can be employed to help reduce sleep terrors, including scheduled awakenings. So breaking up the sleep cycle can help reduce some sleep terrors from occurring. Protection during sleep, if they are waking up quickly or thrashing around, can be important to protect the affected patient from hurting themselves. Regular sleep habits can also reduce the likelihood of sleep terrors. And in some cases, there may be requirement for assessment of abuse. And this can be in both cases of nightmare disorder and sleep terrors in young children, particularly. So if you want to learn more about other sleep conditions, please check my videos on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.